So let's go to God in prayer as we study the book of 1 Corinthians. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have in our lives. And Father, even as we consider this book and all the knowledge that you have in this book for us, we ask, O God, that you will once again pour forth the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Grant that the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened, that we may know the hope of your calling, the riches of your inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of your power towards us who believe. Father, reveal your truths in this book to us, that we may grow, that we may learn of you, that we may continue to be transformed by your presence with us. And continue, Father, to reveal yourself to us, and we ask that you exalt Jesus in our midst. That you call Jesus to be high and lifted up, and that we may love him over and over again. And we ask, O God, that you will continue to stretch forth your hands as you always have done. And you bring healing and confirm your word with signs and wonders, O God. And grant that even as your word is preached, let your healing anointing and your miracle working anointing flow through our lives. So that as we sit in your presence, we are touched by your presence, we are healed. That all sicknesses and disease will flee, O oh Father God, at the proclamation of your word. Thank you, Father God, for authority in the spirit realm. And we continue to take authority over all demonic forces and proclaim, O oh God, the glory of the Lord and the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord and He is Lord here. Yesterday, today, and forever, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Let Him be Lord of our hearts and Lord of our lives. Let Your perfect will be done in our lives, and cause our destinies to be fulfilled. And let this word go forth from here, Lord, to the hundreds of thousands, to the millions, and to the billions out in the world. We thank you, Father God, that you continue to do a mighty work, O oh, Father, in Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. <clears throat> we have finished uh, the first uh, six chapters of Corinthians. I did mention that there are some things that we'll look at. And uh, I have uh, examined it carefully. And we'll look at that, those things because they use the principles uh, that Paul brought forth in other chapters also. And we will tie back to some of those things that he mentioned in the first six chapters. And remember that the key word we found, when we study the Bible book by book, what we are looking for are connections and key words. And we have mentioned how you can find the seven pillars of wisdom inside this book. Inside the, the first uh, six chapters of the book of Corinthians, which has the word wise or the word wisdom occurring all the way right through uh, in the first six chapters especially. It occurs uh, once or twice more after that, but primarily in the first six chapters. And uh, this book of Corinthians is, um, is a book where Paul has to deal with problems of a church that he planted. They did write to him uh, a certain, about certain problems. Paul wrote back to them, and then they wrote back again. The first letter was lost. This first Corinthians is the second letter that he refers to, uh, to his first letter before that. And they wrote to him some things. And not only did they write some things, but there were other problems that they didn't tell Paul that was reported to Paul by the house of Chloe. And uh, Chloe seems to tell him some things. Now that is very common sometimes. Uh, not only in Christianity, but in, uh, in general life and in public life, as, as always. Uh, that sometimes we don't want to put on paper some of those things or the questions. And uh, so they never, it was not among the things that uh, they asked Paul about. And so the first six chapters, Paul dealt with things that they never asked, but was reported by mouth uh, by Chloe. And uh, now as he moved into chapter 7, as we look into chapter 7 all the way up to chapter 14, the next seven chapters uh, before it closed in 15 and 16, we see that finally Paul uh, answers questions that they wrote about. See the theme here in uh, chapter 7, verse 1, says, 
concerning the things of which you wrote to me. Uh, now he begins the official reply to them. So he took six chapters to give the unofficial reply that they never asked. He said, here are the answers to questions you never ask. And you never dare to ask, but it's told to me. And uh, so he wrote all the, all the corrections in the first six chapters. And finally he says, this is now my official reply. Which starts on chapter 7. And it says, concerning those things. Now they, they, they ask more than one thing. These are, it was like, this book is like now a question and answer session. And I love question and answer sessions. And all I need is a mixture of my Greek Bible and my uh, Hebrew Bible is here or, or something. And uh, now everything you can have in digital format. And then we say, hey, let's have a question and answer session. Who knows, we might have a few more sessions like that. Uh, we used to have that. And uh, those, those are good because uh, then we can do the application more precisely on a question. So they did ask Paul some questions. He says, concerning the things. The things they wrote about. And uh, then um, look at verse 25. Chapter 7, verse 25. Concerning virgin. So they must have talked about those things. Say, hey, we don't know what to do about all these things. They got tons of questions, these Corinthians. And then chapter 8, verse 1. Concerning things. Again, he's replying. So many questions they got. Concerning things offered to idols. And say, what are we supposed to do? They must have asked a question. And... Um, and uh, Paul went on a various uh, dissertation about defending his position as, uh, uh, as an apostle to them. And um, then he goes on in chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual or spiritual things or spiritual gifts, uh, he mentioned in chapter 12, verse 1. So obviously, all the way from chapter 7, chapter 8, right through, he was talking concerning things that they brought up about. Subjects, questions uh, about what to do. And uh, Paul did not exactly say what were their questions. He was now giving the answer. And uh, we could assume some of those questions. And as we look at chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and Paul took uh, chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14 to answer the question on spiritual gifts. Uh, so sometimes it takes three, three chapters to answer one question, and um, sometimes it takes within one chapter, as you saw in chapter 7 and chapter 8. Uh, uh, within two chapters, he answered two things. Uh, concerning things regarding uh, marriage, concerning things about idol, uh, idol, idol food, and uh, so he answered them in uh, one chapter. But more difficult things, he answers more than several chapters. As he was answering these questions, there is also a team behind the question and answer. And uh, there is one key word that I was looking for very carefully. Where is the key word? There's a key word that links the thing together. And again, you can't find it in the English because of the translation. And, um, and uh, I'll point out where the key word is in chapter 7. So you link another group of, of chapters together. The first six chapters, as we mentioned, is grouped by the word wise or wisdom. And then in uh, chapter 7 onwards, uh, as they were talking and asking questions about um, uh, marriage and uh, all these uh, areas, uh, etc., Paul, as he was answering the questions uh, in regard to uh, these areas, in uh, looking over here in chapter 7, as he talks about um, uh, all these uh, questions about uh, what to do if one partner believes, the other doesn't believe, and uh, he goes on in chapter 17, talk about the single life and the married life. He says, uh, God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk so he ordained, uh, so he ordained in the churches. But he says, uh, everyone has a calling in God, uh, different callings, and everyone, well, they have their own state of affair that they have to take care of. But uh, as he moves downwards, uh, lower down, as he began to speak about, uh, in verse 37, about what uh, a young person is supposed to do, in verse 37 he says, Nevertheless, he who 
stand steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin. So notice the word power translated there. And that's the word exousia, not the word dunamis. There are four Greek words for power. The most common known are exousia, authority, and the other is dunamis. And so here is the word exousia, uh, but has dunamis or, or he has authority of his own will. Now in chapter 7, verse 4, he also mentions that the wife, and here is translated authority, does not have authority over her own body. That's the word exousia. But the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have exousia or authority over his own body, but the wife does. And so within one chapter, the word exousia stands out. Then when you look at chapter 8, in chapter 8, he speaks about idol worship and uh, uh, what to do about those areas. And he says here, in uh, speaking about uh, idol worship, he says that, uh, in talking about the knowledge, and uh, so let's uh, look at verse uh, 9. He says, Beware lest somehow this liberty of yours, the freedom to, the freedom knowing that you, you're not affected by all these idols and the idol worship and the idol food, make sure it doesn't become a stumbling block to one who is weak. Now in verse 9, the word liberty is the word exousia. You don't find it in the English. So you cannot find the key word <coughs> in the English. You look for a link between all the chapters, you can't find it. But it's in the Greek. <coughs> and so what it says in chapter 8 verse 9 is, but beware lest somehow this exousia of yours, not freedom, but this authority of yours, become a stumbling block for another brother. That's an interesting phrase, which already points to the study that what we're going to do. So, chapter 7, authority, exousia, chapter 8, exousia, and guess what? Chapter 9 also got the word exousia. So you have, you have a key Greek word that stands out. It stands out in all three chapters. In chapter 9, Paul talks about his apostleship and uh, when he talks about his apostles apostleship and his power and his authority as an apostle uh, it tells us here but this word is translated differently in verse 12 you found it i'm just giving the key places where the word occur chapter 9 we're now in chapter 9 verse 12 and um, it says if others are partakers of this right now the word right is the word exousia and you can guess it now by uh, to prepare for the Bible study. I read the text in the Greek to look for the common common word. So when you read uh, the Bible in in Greek, it's different from reading the Bible in uh, in uh, English. Just as some of you could read your Bible in Chinese, you find it slightly different also because of the translation, the nuances of the language, and the way they translate it. And so, because the original is in Greek, and we are looking to discover the common theme, uh, something that occurs in all three chapters. Because the all three chapters are so different. Chapter 7 is one, go, go in one direction. Chapter 8 go in another direction. Chapter 9 run in another direction. And it's not easy to find the link. But there is one key word. Exousia. The word exousia occur. The word right here, R-I-G-H-T, is the Greek word exousia. Exousia. Which is where we get the English word executive. So it's executive power, authority. And here, unfortunately, the English word translates it as right. He says here. And um, Paul talks about his, uh, his right. And uh, in verse 12, he says, if others are partakers of this exousia over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, 
we have not used this exousia. And it occurs a few more times uh, in this chapter, exousia, that he talks about. And um, that's telling us that there's a key theme that is there. However, when I look at it with a fine microscope at chapter 10, chapter 11, and chapter 12, and 13, 14, the word exousia sort of disappeared. Uh, it is still mentioned in some area, but it's sort of uh, not so prominent. Which is why I have divided this uh, chapter 7 right on to chapter 14, where in general Paul was discussing about the questions they raised. So chapter 7 to chapter 14 is answering the questions they raised. I divide it into two sections. The first three chapters, chapter 7, 8, and 9, deal with authority and how to use it. Now think about that. It's not just answering the question. We always say that those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we got exousia and dunamis, authority and power. But then we realize, how do we exercise authority and power? It's found in the first three verses. How to exercise exousia. Then, in the next section, the common word, starting from chapter 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Not so much in 13, but the meaning is that it's sandwiched between uh, chapter 12 and chapter 14 on the gifts. The word, the body of Christ, stands out. And that one you can find in the English. It always, the body of Christ. I did research, I said, I wonder what other keywords is there. Is there like uh, the word koinonia? So, but it didn't occur that often in all these various forms. Koinonia is fellowship, because it began to talk about fellowship. I realized there was a change and a theme in verse 10. But as we look into chapter 10, uh, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, it's always emphasizing the body of Christ. This, this body of Christ that we, we all of. Look at chapter 10, for example. In chapter 10, it says here, um, now, the word liberty in verse 29 also is the word authority. So, that's, uh, there again, we are in chapter 10. But, more or less, there is a focus on the body of the Lord. In verse 16, you find it in chapter 10, verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ, or the koinonia, or fellowship of the body of Christ. So there is, again, the body of Christ. It's now, now Paul, in answering the question, there's a team change into the body of Christ. And uh, that goes on in chapter 11, where we have the famous, uh, well-used passage on the Holy Communion, which is verse 23 to 25, where Paul says he received from the Lord that which... Uh, Jesus, uh, on the night when he was betrayed, said, he took bread and said, this is my body. So again, there's an emphasis on the body of Christ, which goes into chapter 12, where he talked about different gifts, but one body. And uh, then in chapter 13, talks about how in that one body, we all need to grow up. Once we're a child, we, 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 uh, but love is important. Chapter 14 is again focusing on the church and the body, although the word body is not, not used, but it's talking about order within the church. So here's my division for you, very logical division. In uh, chapter 7 to chapter 14, which is what we are covering tonight, chapter 7, 8, 9 deals with exousia, authority. And uh, it's obvious from a study of the Greek words. And uh, then chapter 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, five chapters. So chapter 7 to 14, which is eight chapters because it includes the chapters that are mentioned. The first three chapters refer to exousia. The next five chapters refer to the body of Christ. But here's the key. When you look at the body of Christ and the exousia, 
Exousia, body of Christ. Exousia, body of Christ. Exousia, body of Christ. Doesn't that tell you something? That you begin to have one, one, another word that keep coming to you that even if it didn't occur in the Greek. Exousia always goes with dunamis. If you have been studying through the Bible, you notice every time the Bible mentions exousia, before long it mentioned dunamis. It mentioned dunamis, it also mentioned exousia at some point. Because the two are different sources of power. One is the power based on position, your position in Christ, or delegated authority that God gave to us. The other is the power of the Holy Spirit, dunamis, Acts 1 verse 8. And we look at Acts 1 verse 8. The power of the Holy Spirit is very much dependent on the body of Christ. And what does it talk about? What are the gifts of the Spirit? The gifts of the Spirit are the work of the Holy Spirit. See, we mentioned chapter 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. It's all talking about the body of Christ. You can find the word body of Christ or a, a nuance or a phrase referring to that. Very obvious, easy division. But when you look at the body of Christ, you cannot talk about the body of Christ without talking about the Holy Spirit. The body of Christ is brought together by the Holy Spirit. And obviously, if the Holy Spirit is there, you will have the power of the Holy Spirit, which is dunamis. So I present to you this conclusion. We have spent this, this next few minutes divining it very logically for you, so that you know how to study your Bible. As you look deeper, we're giving you clues there. Chapter 7, 8, 9, Paul indirectly is used by the Holy Spirit to teach us the principles of exousia authority. And the particular examples applied to idolatry, his apostleship, and applied to um, marriage, relationship. And in chapter 10 to chapter 14, Paul was teaching us how dunamis power flows. And how it flows through the body of Christ. What is needed in the body of Christ before dunamis power can flow. Principles of dunamis power. So amazing. We didn't know it's there. First six chapters of, of uh, Corinthians revealing the seven pillars of wisdom. And I already give you a clue what the seven pillars of wisdom are. Uh, I read first from Proverbs last week, and I also read from Revelations, and, uh, so that you can easily find it. And then, we never know when we study First Corinthians that He's going to teach us principles how to exercise your exousia authority. And then, He's going to spend five chapters teaching us how to flow with dunamis power. Hidden inside those chapters 10 to 14. Powerful keys, don't you think so? And then of course, 15 and 16 are conclusion. Have to do with the gospel. So now we all can go home. Bible study over. <laughs> and so you already, already got the outline. But what we want to see is zoom deeper into the outline of exousia authority and then the dunamis power. How the two flow together and the principles involved. And uh, so I won't so much as, as touch those areas that you know very well that you say, okay, this part is about idol worship. This is what Paul said to do, what Paul not, 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 not to do. All those you could easily conclude from there. And most of us have been taught over and over again. We know what it says. But to draw out the principle behind that he's used to solve those problems in line with exousia authority. Now let's look in terms of exousia authority being exercised here in the body of Christ. As we all know, all of us have exousia and dunamis power. It's not a question of whether you have authority and power. The word exousia, strictly speaking, when translated, should be translated authority. The word dunamis, if it's translated, should have been consistently translated power. And if they have done that, it will be easy for us to understand. Every single Christian has dunamis and exousia. 
The question is not whether we have it, but the quantity that we have. Some Christians have more exousia authority and less dunamis power. Some Christians have a lot of dunamis power, but they don't have much exousia power. Two types of power. And I've illustrated one is like the policeman, the other is like the incredible how. Minus the green part and the horrible muscles. Uh, this thought of his t-shirt. No, no t-shirt can fit him. Uh, have you noticed? The Hulk never can have a good t-shirt. They always show the Hulk with just his purple pants. And uh, that's the only thing that they keep him so that it can go on a movie and show properly. Strictly speaking, scientifically, unless his pants is made from some polyamor that can expand, uh, and uh, uh, he should be a naked Hulk. But outside his green skin and his muscles, now, think about it. You all, when you talk about the heart, most of you know who he is, a cartoon character. You know, he's a green fellow with purple pants, a huge, big legs, huge, big muscle. Can you imagine if he had a big, huge, big, huge t-shirt? One of the flabby ones that made him look skinnier. <laughs> he wouldn't look like the heart anymore. He would look like some hippie coming from somewhere. <laughs> As an overweight hippie. And uh, so that's why they never show him with a big, big fat t-shirt. I mean, imagine the house with a big fat t-shirt flapping away. <laughs> Doesn't look good. And uh, so uh, that represents an actual physical power, but more from the spiritual source. There's dynamic power, and the other is executive power. Now the two flow differently, and we need to understand how it flow. Not understanding how it flow is where Christians make mistakes. That's where they make mistakes. Now before I establish that, I go to establish the scriptures where we all do have authority and power. So some of you say, Scripture and what? Alright, fine, i give it to you. Don't have to scream so loud. Anyway, <laughs> Gospel of John, please. Chapter 1, verse 12. John chapter 1, verse 12. Here's where your authority is. Your exousia. And you can claim it in your life, confess it in your life, please, by all means. John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. It says that, As many as receive him, to them he gave the authority. I don't like the word right. I just like the word exousia. And uh, give the authority, that's a better word, to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, but nor of the will of man, but of God. So you were born as a kingly anointing, a kingly authority. We were made kings and priests. And the kingly authority, that's exousia. You were born again with exousia authority. As long as you call yourself a son of God, a son of God has authority. Maybe you are a son of God under training. Understand, no problem. But that means you're under training of exousia authority. Learning how to operate that authority. The verse that confirms you got your um, dunamis power is Acts 1 verse 8. A verse that you all know that we don't have to turn to, you can just quote. And uh, after Jesus uh, went back uh, and he was um, taken in ascension, the disciples were still looking up. The angel appeared to them and said, Why looking up? He says, uh, says yeah, you shall receive power, or, or rather, and just before Jesus uh, was ascended on high, uh, the, uh, the, the disciple says, What about Israel? When will it be restored? And Jesus said, All these things the Father has in his own time and season. He said, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. The word dunamis is power. Cross reference X 1 8 with Luke chapter 24, verse 49, and he described it as cloth with power from on high. So, dunamis power is a supernatural uh, charge of strength that comes to you. And uh, it, it, it's a gift that God gives, dunamis power. 1 Corinthians 12, which we are looking at, tells us that to each one the Holy Spirit has given 
a gift. And that gift is energized by Dunami's power. That is that. And Dunami's power is another way of us saying the anointing upon. The anointing upon. And ex, uh, exousia power is where we sometimes call it the anointing within. Because you're born again. It's a part of your spirit man. Ties with your spirit man. And learning to function in both is important. And uh, remember our definition. Exousia power is a power based on your position. Your position with God as a son of God. Your position with God, maybe, uh, let's say, your apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, or you have, uh, you have a certain calling, you, 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 are, you have a call into the business world, whatever. Whatever God has put you into the position, you have an exousia authority. It. And that is based on positional. Your position in God. Where in the body of Christ God has put you. Surely, our ears can say, I have all authority over every sound. You're going to argue with your ears? Is the nose going to say, Nah, I also can, feel, can, can smell sound. No, but what's the use of your nose smelling sound for? Right? Our nose can actually be sensitive to sound. But the only sensitivity is you're going to make it sneeze. Not going to do anything else. And so, that's the wrong part of our body. And so, our ears definitely can say, I have authority over sound. All sound processed by me, say the ear. And uh, the eye is not going to argue. The eye say, that's fine. But I have authority over all light. I can see light. And so, whatever position God has placed you in the body of Christ is important. You might not think it's important, it is very important. Although some people are still figuring out what to do about their little toe at the end of their feet. You say, what's that toe for? Uh, wait till somebody steps on it, you know how important it is. <laughs> okay, so I believe it's for balancing, you know, wait till you climb mountains and wait till you go swimming. And you realize, oh, you know, the bigger the spread, the better. Okay, even more wet feet, but we are not ducks, right? So, and uh, so they all have a purpose: a balancing, elegance of walking. You know, you lose a few toes, your walk might not be so elegant, or whatever else, and the balance of your body. So every part of the body, of Christ, wherever your position has given you exousia, and you must believe in your exousia. And then, any gift that God has put into your life to operate, that has to do with the energy of God flowing and through you. And you would have a sense of power flowing. So, the toaster can say, I'm made to be a toaster. As long as electricity flow, I can toast bread for you. What's a toaster good for? In every movie, when they want to construct something, when they make it as if you can take a toaster and turn it into a robot or something else, right? And uh, when they build things, they say, oh, and on top of it, add this toaster. As if toaster can do a lot of things. All a toaster has is a heating element and that's all. And uh, not much you can get out of that, no matter how clever you are. But the toaster cannot toast if you got no electricity. So it might have a gift of a toasting, but no electricity, no toast. And uh, then a light bulb, all it's good for is giving light. No electricity, it's, it's totally no use. So it's dependent on the energy that flows at that time. If the energy doesn't flow, it just doesn't work. And you can look at it as the energy or the electricity that you have through a fixed system or even in a torchlight or in your iPhone or iPod. Uh, nowadays, of course, it's like a little computer. Let's, let's, let's go back to those uh, old things. Let's say you have your uh, mini MP3 player. 
Okay, it's only good for playing MP3. And uh, no batteries, uh, batteries dead, it cannot play anymore. As long as it's there, energy flow, it can flow. And that is gifts that we all have. Now we have to differentiate between exousia and authority. Let's look at the disciples. They do have exousia and dunamis, both given to them. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, and Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. When he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Then you cross-reference to Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Luke chapter 9, verse 1. And Luke, because he's a doctor, he writes this type of thing with more accuracy. Especially if you look at the Gospel of Luke, the description of disease and sickness is slightly more written from a perspective of someone who knows sickness and disease. In chapter 9, verse 1, he says, He called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority. He gave them dunamis and exousia. What for? He says, over all demons and to cure diseases. Say, why, why over demons and over diseases? And here's the thing. Most of the time, demons are cast out by exousia authority. Demons also can be chased out by dunamis power. Makes them feel uncomfortable because energy flowing. What about sickness and diseases? Sickness and diseases especially if they're spiritually caused. And the origin of them is a spiritual cause. Exousia authority can remove them. But if a sickness or disease is caused by an organic or natural cause, just as it is going to take a long time for you to command the mountain to go to the sea, for it to actually happen, it might take a long time for you to command a sickness and disease, using exclusive authority to respond if it's organically caused. However, if it's organically caused, when the gift of the spirit works and energize, spiritual energy can create things. Just as Jesus can multiply the bread and five loaves, two fishes can feed 5,000 people, molecular change. So spiritual energy can energize the, the molecular level and actually make physical changes to the physical body cell, bringing healing to it and even killing and driving bacteria and diseases. That is true dunamis power. And now you begin to see the tools. See, Christianity, you know, it's not like, if I can use this word, Lord, forgive me. One size fits all. We all got authority and power. Yeah, yeah. We go, we go apply. Uh, but we need to learn to be specialists in understanding how to handle exousia and sicknesses. So whenever you go out and pray for the sick, you can become more effective. Because you can go and you could pick up in the spirit. Of course, somebody, hey, what do you mean by pick up in the spirit? Gone already. Right? Uh, half the Christians gone. They cannot pick up in the spirit. Finish. Right. But that's why uh, the sensing is that. But even sometimes, uh, without this area, and here it's that exousia authority is yours 24 hours a day, whether you pray up or you don't pray up. Whether you just woke up and you don't feel like doing your devotion, you don't feel the presence of God, and uh, the star is still in your eyes, your hair is still all ruffled, and you're still in your striped pajamas. And you don't really look like a great man or woman of God. 
all well done, nice, glorious, and all that. But Exousia is just 24 hours. Even in that condition, if Exousia authority is needed, and you just declare, in Jesus' name, I command this sickness to go. Boom! It would have gone if it's spiritually caused. Or it would have gone if it's a demon. If you know your exousia, demons will respond. See, why did Jesus give them two authorities? Exousia, two powers, exousia and dunamis. Because sometimes you use this, sometimes you use that. So exousia authority is when Jesus was sleeping on the boat. And uh, remember, he was sleeping. They all were drowning. So they said, Master, Master, save us. Right? They cannot save themselves. Nehim, the guy who was sleeping there. So he got up and he spoke to the wind. The wind come. And they said, Wow, what kind of person needs authority? Exousia authority. So they realized. And you could have that because whether you feel pray up or you don't feel pray up, that authority works. It's yours for life. Provided you don't doubt. The moment you doubt, it's no more yours. Have you ever come, have you ever had someone, uh, a policeman come to you and say, I'm not really sure whether I'm a policeman or not, but I'm going to arrest you. <laughs> Where's your ID? <laughs> Before you enter the house, show your identity. He said, I'm really not sure, you know, my ID is not fake or not. Uniform, maybe, maybe a bought form, but uh, I was going to say Chow Kid, which is the KL, you know, he bought the uniform from some uh, printing press or somewhere, but he, he cannot function if he's not sure. A social authority needs you to be confident of who you are in the Lord. You need to know. That's why when you meditate on God's Word, your exousia authority seems to develop. That's why meditation on the Word feeds the anointing with it. You can feel it. And it helps remove doubts. Doubts in your conscious mind, they're easier to deal with. The harder doubts to deal with are those in your subconscious mind that doesn't even come up. That, that your conscious mind telling you believe, but your subconscious says, liar, liar, pants on fire, but you don't know. Right. So, because you know, everything about you is your doubting, the whole thing. And it takes time for us to believe who we are in Christ. I mean, some people who are freshly born again, it takes them one year to believe they're really a child of God. Now, some of you have been in Christ so long, You've been up, you've been down, you're through the mountains, you've been through the valley, some of you have been through the desert, some of you have even been through hell and back. And, and I ask you, are you safe? You say, yes, without any doubt. Because you somehow knew that you're a child of God. But that might not be your obvious answer if you were just the first few months Christian. You might say that. But after so long, you understand God's salvation, you understand the work of Christ, it's sung into your subconscious. You know your child God. And that's why meditation fits into this area. Then we have this dunamis gift. Now this dunamis gift, remember, needs to connect to energy. You need to have this energy flow, this electricity flow in the natural. If you're a toaster, you need electricity. If you're a torchlight, you need good batteries. To supply the electricity. If your MP3 play, you need electricity. If your phone, you need electricity to function. You need the batteries to be good, to function. Uh, and you can only really function what you were created to function in. Nothing more, nothing less. That's the gift. And so, for the gifts to operate, you definitely need to pray up. Definitely need. To spend time with God. Spending time and praying to God is like plugging yourself into the socket where God's energy can flow through you. And that's why sometimes a sickness and disease will respond to exousia, but sometimes they don't because they're organically caused. And the power to physically change molecules is not in exousia authority. 
It's in dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. And He can change and turn things. And that's why they sometimes say, well, oh, if anyone is sick in the book of James, what was the qualification? Call the pastor. In the word, remember the elder is another word for pastor in the New Testament time. Because in Acts 14 23, they appointed elders when the apostles left. So uh, the word pastor was not in common usage at that time. The word elders was. And so elders were part of the pastoral system. So if anyone is sick, call the pastor, call the elder. Why? Because they are in a delegated position. See, if the pastor pray, he got the believer's anointing, which is uh, the authority of a believer, plus he got authority of at least a representative of Christ in a local church. And he can exercise his exousia against the sickness and disease. That's why the Bible tells you to do that. He didn't say whether that pastor is anointed or had the gift of the spirit, whether he had the gift of healing and all those things. He didn't say just his exousia authority by virtue of his position in the church. And whereas the gifts of the spirit, you, whether you got position or no position in the church, doesn't matter. You were made to be such. And an ordinary housewife might be a miracle worker. She has no appointment in exousia. But she could be one of those housewives like Brother Lawrence. But since it's a lady, we have to call her Sister Lucy. <laughs> so instead of Lawrence in the practice, practicing the presence of God, it was Sister Lucy practicing the presence of God. So she would go cooking under the anointing of the Spirit because she's worshipping. Every time she fried quite down, her hand go, Hallelujah! Phew, all cooking always very good too. And uh, so all the things. So she's praising the Lord every day. Every time she vacuums, she says, Praise the Lord, God of all the vacuum cleaners. You are my God and I worship you. So she is like a, 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 a sister version of Brother Lawrence. And so she got this presence of God and God might have given her a gift of working a miracle. And who knows? As she is always living in the presence, she's energized. And then every time, you know, as she's led by the Lord, and uh, she sends, oh, you know, that God wants her to go and heal somebody. She might go out and then she will declare in Jesus' name and she might, she might see some miracles and then come back and people will realize, wow, you know, this sister is powerful. Powerful. And uh, she is both powerful and powderful because you know uh, the powderful doesn't mean she put a lot of makeup powder before she goes up eh? and uh, every time you know, wherever she go you know the dust flies behind her Shoom. and uh, so uh, she could be an anointing on the Holy Spirit now understand that that the gifts of the Spirit need time to pray like for example now we are mainly doing teaching and then occasionally the gifts of the Spirit will work that's fine but if the day comes when, when, we start have, when we start doing healing services and all that, uh, and all those things, then most of the time, um, see, when I teach the Word, I'm teaching the Word under my appointed office. And my appointed office automatically functions in that authority and teach the Word with authority. Didn't they say that, that Jesus' words will be authority from that authority level? But if there's a healing and all that, it becomes a healing service, then it's different approach. Where you need to sense the energy, then it's different. And so, preparing for healing meeting, you won't find me there waiting to shake your hands. I'll be in a prayer room. All prayer. And then, uh, once everything is right, then comes out charging fuel with electricity. And it's different. Different operation. So when you learn to operate both differently, uh, then you understand these two powers. The question is, having generalized all these things, we look back and see, in Corinthians, it tells you those principles. Hidden inside the simple answers. Right? Generally quite simple answers to the questions. By now simple for most of us because clear, clear cut. Hidden behind it is how to flow in exousia, how to flow in dunamis. So let's look at 1 Corinthians. All those background is necessary, so we appreciate what Paul is unveiling in 1 Corinthians to us. And hidden within the three chapters of 7, 8, 9, 
are these principles to flow with exousia authority. From chapter 7, we learn this. To differentiate between hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit and hearing the voice of your human spirit. Say, ah? Where? Which? How? Who? But it's the worst. Thank you very much for asking. I have to ask all these questions for you all because you're very silent here. Chapter 7, he says here. Now, to the question of husbands and wife, right? His answers are very obvious. He says, first of all, let me summarize chapter 7 for you. Basically, chapter 7, Paul is propagating that in the times that he lived in, at that time, persecution coming, he says, it's better you know, to remain as he is. He advocates uh, celibacy. But then he recognized not everybody can be celibacy and that's a different calling, different gift. And then he says, those, uh, that each one has their own calling. So he says in general that marriage is good. And then he talks about the order of the marriage, how that both must have some equality. He says that the husband has power over uh, uh, the, the wife's body and the wife has power over the husband's body. So there's some equality, although in general, in the, the husband is a head, the, the wife is a neck. Wife is a neck. Okay. <laughs> That's our scripture. It's not in the Bible. The Bible just said, husband is the head and the sins, the, the, the woman is the rest of the body. You know, like Jesus is our head and we are his body in a sense. Right, because neck is still part of the body. Right? So we give women a little bit more status because neck is just right next to the body. Uh, don't forget, necks can be very powerful. If your neck cannot turn, uh, you're going to turn the whole body. If your neck cannot turn, uh, you cannot eat properly also. You can't even see the food you're eating. You know? you got to look at the distance. Ah, oh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the tofu. Okay, I'm going to have it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah, maybe some of you might bang your neck. <laughs> and then, so next can be powerful, alright? So Paul telling us that in that relationship there's a measure of equality. But he also deals with their questions. So he'll say, What happened if one come to know the Lord? So he deals with their question of saying, Well, if one come to know the Lord, you know, uh, and the other uh, the other unbeliever, if the other unbeliever cannot stand it and goes, he says, You're not under bondage. He says, you know, live your life as you are. And uh, so he, he says, you're not condemned at all uh, in that situation. So these are his clear-cut, simple answers that he has. Behind all this is this principle. To hear the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, or to hear your human spirit. And look at how Paul, as he answers the question, he says here in uh, chapter 7, verse 10, To the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. So he says here, this that I'm writing comes directly with, thus saith the Lord. Not just thus saith Paul, but he say, thus saith the Lord. And he says, uh, I do command to, but not just I, the Lord says, so he says, thus says the Lord. And he tells, a wife is not to depart from her husband. And then he says, even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and her husband is not to divorce his wife. Verse 12. To the rest, I, not the Lord. Can you see that? He says, this is Paul speaking, without a dust says the Lord. This is specific advice, he says. If any brother has a wife who does not believe, and she is willing to live with him, let us stay. No problem with that. He says, in this case, I don't have a that says the Lord. Now, this is very important. Because when you have a that says the Lord, there's no more discussion. The only discussion is to obey and not to obey. And of course, being good people, we don't want to disobey. So when anyone says, that say the Lord, what well, discussion over. That is why no church business meeting should be run with that say of the Lord. Everybody, no, no, no chance to discuss. Right. And that's why most of the time, even, even in the business of the church in Jerusalem, the first church, Jerusalem, chapter 15, 
Did any one of them say, Thus said the Lord? No, they discuss first. They talk first. They argue. They, 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 they bring the scriptures. And then they will settle on three things. They will settle based on uh, the word of testimony. They will settle based on if you go to the Holy Ghost and to them. And then they settle on scriptures that they brought forth. But they didn't settle the question with some prophet saying, Thus says the Lord, this is that. That's it. Because life is not as easy as it is. And God allows us some delegated responsibility. You say, why does God do things like that? Why don't God just give us black and white answers straight away? Now, I want to make it very clear. With God, everything is black and white. Everything is black and white. There's no, there's no shadow of turning with Him. But in our understanding, some things that the human race sees as white, that God sees as black, God's long suffering allows us time to slowly see as black. Example, slavery. Slavery was not something that they could change in 10 years. Slavery was entrenched into every civilization. And it would take thousands of years for human beings to change. Until today in our modern society, slavery is illegal. At least as much as the International uh, United Nations uh, Covenant, the All Nations sign, is. Slavery is illegal. I know, you know they're criminals, they're you know, selling, buying people and all that, but that's like illegal now. Illegal is a fact that we want to emphasize. Long ago, it was legal. Legal in a country's law. Legal in a nation. Now tell me, how can the church in 10, 20 years change something in society that it's going to take two, 3,000 years for society to give it up? America has to fight a civil war before the... the, the, the uh, issue of slavery was settled. Remember, the civil war was about slavery. The northern uh, northern states want to free. The southern states depend on the slaves. The industry depend on slaves. They were against setting the slaves free. Wars are fought over all these things. In the Roman Empire, slavery was still legal. People don't own their lives. People own slaves. In the Bible times, in the Old Testament, and God knows it is wrong. It is wrong. In the Old Testament time, there were slaves. Egypt, and all those things. And even some of the Bible people who came out, they owned slaves. God cannot deal with a 2,000-year-old issue because it's longer than a human life. At least, we don't have the length of life of the first patriarchs of creation. But, how could God deal with the issue? God slowly let us see it as black. And in that case, the church needs to make its localized decision within its context of what we call grey issues. Grey issues are issues we cannot see clearly white and black. We've got to make a contextual decision in the society that you live in. Where the issue of black and white is not so clear now. You've got to make your own individual decision. Although for God, you could see black and black. White, black is black, white is white. But from our human perspective, where our sense of right and wrong is not as sensitive to God, and the revelation to the human civilization at that time, might not be so great yet. The whole human race might not even be able to see what is right and wrong yet. And so God, put, God won't put up with us. He put up with us. And so in that sense, we need to sense between does save the Lord and what save our spirit. Our spirit will find a way of acting correctly and what was Paul saying correctly in the time of slavery? He says, if you have a chance to be free, take the freedom. If not, be content with where you are. You have even a Bible example. 
You know the book of Philemon, or rather the epistle of Philemon, a short little one chapter book. Philemon was written because of a runaway slave. The runaway slave's name was the one that Eddie loves. Onesimus. <laughs> what do you call that? Oni. Uh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oni who likes Oni. <clears throat> Onesimus. Onesimus ran away from his master. And of all people he ran to, he ran to the Apostle Paul. Now what is Paul to do? Philemon who owns Onesimus was a believer. Paul stayed with him. Paul might have known him very well. And Onesimus also born again. Now Onesimus runs to him. He is now in the middle. If he says Onesimus, he can go free. He's in trouble with Philemon. If he uh, just sends Onesimus back, uh, Philemon might punish Onesimus. So what did Paul do? Paul did a compromise situation. Paul wrote the letter of Philemon, encouraging Philemon to take back Onesimus. He told Onesimus, this is not right. I cannot hide you. Say, why not? Now, if Paul were living today, it's different. He lived at that time where slavery is part of the Roman Empire system. And Paul has to send him back. You know, according to the law of those times, if you harbor a slave who runs away, you harbor his stolen property. The empire's law. And the empire, the empire might strike back. <laughs> so, he has to return up and he has to find a way where he persuaded Philemon and say, forgive Onesimus, but please treat him as a brother. And then he write, he's very good in his argument. He said, Philemon, you owe me a lot. Oh, I look at his argument. You read Philemon. You owe me a lot. All the things that you, you I've done for you, you owe me. Count a debt repaid. You take all these humans back as a brother. <laughs> Not bad, his situation. So you have this situation that we have, Chris, have to deal with. The ability to hear does says a lot and the ability to hear the spirit man. See, why the difference? Because when you operate under a social authority, you have to be able to sense which level of exousia are you operating on. There is levels of operating. And when you make a command and say, in Jesus' name, is it coming at the apostolic fivefold level? Is it coming from a believer's level? And you need to sense it. And Paul would sometimes say, look, this is not coming directly from the Lord. This is only his advice. And if it's advice, it means you can also say, I might not want to follow the advice. I feel differently. You can disagree with Paul because you say that's what you see, but I might see it differently. If he says, this is not the Lord, this is just me, he says. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. And he didn't even quote. When he's quoting for apostolic authority, he will always say, that says a lot. Because when you function under authority, you always use the authority of the name above you, which is the Lord. In the end, all five for everything comes from the Lord. So Paul quotes at that level. And that was an important differentiation of functioning. Uh, which is why... In functioning with exousia authority, if you cannot differentiate between what the Lord is saying in the situation. And look, these are fresh words that Paul hears from the Lord. And he can confirm with the scripture and say, this is what the Lord says. That says the Lord, he says. And not just him, he say this is a command, he says. In uh, chapter 7, verse 10. And then in chapter 7, with 12, he says, this is not a command. This is just what I am thinking is the best course of action. He could differentiate the levels of authority to flow in. And uh, how do we apply that in real life? Well, when someone comes and who is sick, let's say someone takes James chapter 5 and uh, calls 
and says, you know, I'm following James chapter 5, and here, uh, you know, uh, I'm sick, and here, uh, I'm supposed to be prayed for. And James chapter 5 tells us, you will anoint, and they will be healed. Correct. But, what happens as you anoint, and the Lord tells you, this person is going to die in three days. Which he might have. He might say, or he might say, okay, this person is suffering because of this area, and this person has lived in a permissive way for five years, I'm going to take this person home. What happens when you hear that says the Lord? So, wouldn't you be contradicting the Lord and say, you know, the Bible says, lay hands on the sick and they recover. Choom, go, recover. But then there's a revelation that the Lord gives and says, okay, in this case, what shall we do? Well, if you want a Bible case, there is in First John. You can pray for everybody except those who sin a sin unto death. Where First John chapter 5 says, cannot pray for the person anymore. The person has stepped beyond the boundaries. So here's where we are sensitive to what is the Lord saying? What did the Lord say in this situation? And while well, you exercise your normal level of authority, that differentiation is important. And that is also why we don't go every street corner or every, every dark corner and cast out every demon. Why? Because demons will just go and then they'll go somewhere else. They have to go somewhere. We expect demons to go when you cast them out. Oh, to dry places. Yeah, after that. I mean, they're not going to remain in right places for long. You cannot say, I cast you out to the right places and remain there forever. There's no scripture for that. The Bible never tells you where to send them. The Bible only tells you to can, ask them to come out. So, even Jesus said, they will try to come back after the house is clean. With seven words. So, what are you going to do? When, what should we do in terms of casting out demons? And remember Paul himself never cast out the demon until in Acts 16 when he reached a certain point. And uh, so we don't go around every, every street corner and, uh, and cast the demons everywhere. Or, you know, some say, oh no, we keep casting every place, every Christian, cast, 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 cast. So where do they go? There are also entities that need to go somewhere. Oh, go to hell. Remember, there's no time to send them to hell. If, if, Je- if, Jesus, if, if it was time Jesus would send them long ago, we got less demons to deal with. This answer he actually gave to Kenneth Higgin. Because Kenneth Higgin asked him, when he's teaching him about casting demon. He said, so, uh, can, can we send him away, you know, into uh, uh, hell or anywhere? Jesus says, if, if that could have been done, I would have done that for you, you would have less demons to deal with. Smart answer. Of course that's the answer. You think Jesus wouldn't have done it? And he says, it's not time yet. Remember, demons always say, a oh, time is not real right yet. And then they were screaming because they saw Jesus. And it's not time for them all to be removed. They have to go somewhere. And I've seen it before. Sometimes you cast out, the demon come out from a person, go across the road to the other house. So you cast out, and then you cast out another one, go to the house. Well, after the house full of demons, and the poor guy there doesn't know the demons are, you know, finding a shelter in his house. <laughs> So he cast the demons and, and then all congregate somewhere and other places will be suffering of the oppression of the demon. They have to go somewhere. They're good right places, but they're, they're, they're suffering of oppression. There's a time and place. Because some people, smart alike, like, say, every country, rise and curse demons now, super demon. All demons go to the ocean, share the place with the sharks. <laughs> Not scriptural. Demons congregate where, he, where humans go. And so, there's also this area of discernment and knowing and um, uh, where one needs to know that sometimes there's a release of faith and other times there are some things where demons might have a hold over a person's life hold over a person's life and um, uh, I remember one time uh, when long ago when we were new to demon casting these people have been trying to cast out the demon for several hours the moment I walked there, the Lord says, the person, this, it was a sister, uh, uh, oh, I kind of call it a sister, we don't know whether born again yet, but it was a lady, a uh, young lady, and, and uh, the screaming, and I said, when I walk in, the Lord says, she's wearing something. Then I asked one of the sisters, take her to the side and check what she's wearing. She's wearing this, this string thing around. 
and they have been doing it for two two odd hours before I reached there. And the moment they cut the thing, the demon screen left five minutes. So you know, exercise your authority. Demon also exercise their authority. I, I'm supposed to be here. This is my right. This is my right. But you cannot hear him reply. <laughs> and uh, so you one hour you say get out, and then he come back. No, get out. No, get out. No. And you don't know why he keep clinging there. Because you couldn't hear the Lord. That says the Lord. In different shape from what your human spirit is knowing. Again, two different uh, levels there is there. And of course, it's good to sometimes the Lord reveal and you see them. And I remember in one of those meetings that we have uh, when we were HSR, when we did a bit more healing and the people who were sick who, who need healing, and there was a particular person and, and he came in. Uh, uh, usually, when the gift operates, then the, the, the vision occurs. So, his healing was operating. And I see this demon clinging to this person's leg, about three feet tall, black fellow, clinging to this fellow. And uh, clinging in quite a uh, very pitiful way. So like, you know, like the dog clinging to the legs. <laughs> this demon, demon was clinging to the leg. You know, he really, really loved the person's leg. But actually the leg was cancerous. <laughs> uh, cancer, cancer, can, cancerous. And so, so in the vision, and uh, so commanded the demon to leave. And I saw the demon reluctantly let go with us. Very strange looking face. Uh. It's evil looking yet sad looking. You can mix evil and sad together, that's what it looked like. And then when it went, went off, I don't know where it went outside, but it probably looked for another leg to cling. <laughs> and, um, don't worry, it's not in none in be none of you when you came in, so don't worry. So it looked like, uh, and then and uh, so uh, subsequently later, I had the person recovered from that 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 thing. I believe the person should be all right now, uh, as far as the person is concerned. And strange things they do. Sometimes when you go to a house, you remove idols. You remove idols. I saw, you know, there was uh, this uh, you know. Uh, 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 and, and the night before remove this, you know, uh, there's uh, demons already seem to know. And then we went to remove these uh, uh, big fat fellas were there. And because the house was going to dedicate to the Lord as we anoint the whole house and speak peace in the house, this big fat fellow, like they carry their tummy. You know. And then he walks across the road, go into the house opposite. Of course, I didn't. I don't know who lives in the house opposite, so I didn't bother to see. But that guy had a new entity living with that guy. Didn't pay rent, one son. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, all these strange things are going on that you realize that the authority that we have has to be led by the Lord. Because uh, I, I mean, can you imagine if uh, I don't know what happened if you cast out all the demons along the whole row of houses, whether all the demons would go and enter that one house? So the poor guy could be an innocent fellow, you know, who just at one tiny open door, suddenly his house is filled with 200 demons, right? You know, to do things like that without being led by the Lord. And uh, so there is exercising our authority, we need to uh, sense, uh, that says a lot. We still need to hear that says a lot. You cannot go by, the Lord says, you know, this is what I do, boom, that's it. You can if you want, you're functioning in exousia authority, but he had no sensitivity to that says the Lord. That is that. Now notice, under the marriage question in chapter 7, that they were asking Paul about, the law of marriage and divorce was clear cut black and white. But the application is a bit complex. It's not as clear cut as it is. And you have to exercise a rule and authority to make a decision for that. And then in chapter 8, the other principle that they were learning on in, in terms of uh, the authority. And again, this is authority that is applied to uh, idol worship. Now notice here, the authority is exercised with consideration for people who are not functioning at a high level of authority. That it says, and here's a principle that is there. Verse 11, Because of your knowledge, the weak brother dies. 
Can you see that? The weaker brother dies. And then he says in verse 9, Beware lest this liberty or this authority of yours become a stumbling block to somebody else. Now, how can the authority that I have and I enjoy it become a stumbling block for somebody else? The most typical example is the, the eating idle food. But they apply more than that. For example, uh, I can go and watch a movie show with, with many people. I can, sit, I can sit and watch some television shows with people. Now, I know nowadays all movies, all television got some bad things. Uh, my wife calls it black jelly beans, see and that. But, uh, no, no, things that are not ethical, not really in the Bible and all things thrown in. But you pick up the you pick up the bones, you drop the bones, and you look behind the story as illustration and say, then why why not we just don't don't read don't look at the movie, don't read paper, don't do every day, just look at the Bible. Sun sunrise to sunset. Well, for one thing, our world will be a bit more dull. Why? Not much illustration. You, in English language, if you illustrate the Cinderella story, if you never read Cinderella, you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, and so, uh, language is filled with all kinds of description, and the more vast your knowledge, the more you can illustrate things. And uh, so, to one who is not affected, you might stumble the other person who might be affected. So when you enjoy your authority, you must also understand that you must be careful not to stumble the lowest one. When you know it doesn't affect you, but you know it can affect them, you don't do it at all. You don't do it. Like for example, if, if right now uh, we go to a place, let's say in India, and when my wife and I would, if we are together, we will always sit together, side by side. But if I go to a certain place in India, my wife might go and see one side, I go and see one side. Why? The Indian culture. In that particular place, where men and women don't sit together. And so, are we compromising at that time? No. We're exercising the authority we have according to the conscience of the people around. How, at what level they can take it. And so, that's a different level. And different cultures got slightly different different levels and uh, of, of uh, liberty or the authority, things that you might not affect. And here's the interesting thing. As you grow in the law, there are a lot of things that don't affect you anymore. That will affect a younger Christian. It doesn't affect you anymore. Younger Christians still get affected, but you don't. But you always live your life according to the lowest that can be affected. And, and you make sure that you know, they are, they're not affected. Like, for example, in my own personal life, and in my own family, uh, uh, I don't actually take medicine or anything at all. And, and I hardly fall sick. And um, so I have a policy where I fight through. Uh, in simple cases where uh, I had uh, a week or so, this is about a week or so, I had uh, my wisdom to remove. And, uh, and you're given uh, pain, pain, uh, painkillers, three, three pills. So I did say, you know, I don't actually need it because I meditate and I don't feel any pain. I say, wow, can I? So good, yes. Because if you understand it, pain is a secretion of a chemical that is in your nerve transmission. You can call pain chemical. It's a chemical. When you, when you have a merry heart and you laugh, you also produce chemicals. We know that. Minus prayer. Now on top of that, when you add prayer, imagine if you could meditate and pray and you could understand how to overcome pain. You don't need pain at all. So that's it. So I uh, would not use, but, but yet when we look at decisions to be made at people's level, I would see where a person's faith level is. And I will go and flow with a person's faith level. And if a person really struggles with pain because of their faith level, I won't say, hey, I've done it. And let's say, some of you take up your wisdom too. I might start a law and say, 
no pain killers allowed. Wow, finish. No, so wow, another person. Oh, what, what am I doing? You? you just meditate. <laughs> no, but they can't do it. So you cannot do that as a rule. And so uh, the person who, uh, what I might, if the person is at the level where they need it, I might actually go and buy the Panadol for that guy to relieve their pain because it's at that level. Not so much as the same level as you live it. So when we exercise our authority, we need to be aware of the lowest conscience that is there. Is the person's conscience affected? Because they see you do it, they do the same thing, they jump in. You live without medicine, they live without medicine. You live without medicine, you live 120 years. They, they li- see you live without medicine, they go the same way, they live only 25 years. <laughs> Cannot. So they die because they, their faith is not at a level. One walks by faith. And so there is that. Uh, in chapter 8, we are taught that when you exercise your authority, you look at the conscience and the lowest faith level of the people there. And you flow with that level. Because the strong can always bear with the weak. But the weak can never reach up to the strong. That's the principle of God. Chapter 9. In terms of uh, spiritual and material, Paul says in verse 11, he says he has a right. If he has sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Because he was an apostle to the church in Corinth. And he says uh, they could have that. And that is where the, we learn from the apostle Paul. If you want your spiritual authority to be strong and retain strong, and pure. You know, exclusive authority is from the Lord. As pure as possible, you do not exchange it for material things. You do not use, you do not overuse dunamis anointing to try to go for wealth. You do not seek a position in the kingdom of God for material gain or for fame. You do not use authority in order to take advantage of people materially. Although, so, uh, exousia authority must also flow with purity. Which is why when a person exercise their authority, I always say, you know, it's, it's best if they exercise it as a free gift, the way Paul offer. If you want to keep your spiritual authority as pure as possible, give it free. The same way you receive it as a gift from God, you give it free. Paul gave his apostleship free. He charged nothing to the Corinthian. And I always say, people give a love offering, but you should not be required to do that. And people need that mental understanding for it to retain its purity. And when spiritual authority becomes corrupted with material position and material, material possessions, you have corruption in the church. As have happened in church history, when the spiritual position of the church, uh, of the Pope and the papacy became both a natural material position and, uh, and the church reached its most corrupt stage and a sad part of church history. In terms of dunamis authority, there are lessons that we learn. <coughs> uh, in dunamis authority, we realize here that Dunamis authority, we begin to look at chapter 10, 11, 12, uh, 13, and 14. The most obvious that we're going to point to, there are several other principles. The most obvious principle that to walk in, in the anointing of the Spirit, in Dunamis, the most obvious is love. If you don't have agape love, where you have to actually flow in the energy and anointing of God. So, by this, you can also tell those who are walking under false anointing. And because there is none of the agape love flowing out. And agape love is at the core of all the gifts of the Spirit. Paul says that in the book of 
First Corinthians 13. He says there's tongues, there's tongues of men, tongues of angels. You don't have love, it's just sounds. You have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, but you don't have faith, uh, then uh, 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 all this knowledge, but you don't have love, it's nothing. You have faith to sing to faith, remove mountain, have no love, also nothing. And uh, so it's not just the mysteries that are unveiled, but the core thing is does it lead you to love God more? Does it lead you back in, to love? Was it born in love as a source? And does it lead you back to love people more? Because as Paul says in Corinthians 8, knowledge puffs up. But love edifies. And. Uh, you could, you could tell. Uh, uh, sometimes people send me, many years ago, someone sent me some CDs from some quote-unquote faith healer from Africa. Stacks of CD. Took one look and I say, this is not the Holy Spirit. Definitely not the Holy Spirit. But at that time, we make a determination. A lot of things are not public yet. And now, there are enough people who have gone back and looked at it again. And some of the disciples of that person have come out and told what they had done behind the scene. A lot of things that were, uh, uh, that were purposely, and they are not cancerous, they present it as cancerous. And later on, it's healed, they claim that it's cancer healed. All kinds of false things that has now been established. Unfortunately, in some circles, that person is still looked at and he has even preached in some churches, in some church meetings. But when I look at that person, I say straight away, this is not the Holy Spirit working. It's one of those lower spirits that I have seen working also in that dimension. And uh, so there is uh, one of the things that you immediately see, eh? I immediately could feel, even you cannot see, you could feel, there's no agape love flowing. Where agape love is absent, God is absent. Because wherever God's true presence is, there is always agape love. God is love, Bible says. God is love. And it's the one of the few. God is love, God is light. God is love, God is light, God is life. Those three things. Which means that true love is also God. It's a reverse equation. And Paul tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, right at the ending in verse 31, he says, Earnestly desire the best gifts, yet I show you a more excellent way. Do you see the word way? Why does he use the word way? A way is like a channel. How to channel the anointing. Again, I tell you, in chapter 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 is teaching you the secrets of how to flow in the anointing. There's a way to flow in it. And chapter 14 was one. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. See, how can the two go together? In fact, some of the word desire, you know, is translated covered earnestly the best gifts in, in chapter, chapter 12, verse 31. When it says desire, some translate is covered earnestly the best gift. Yet there's an excellent way to flow in it. So, uh, chapter 13 is sandwiched by these two, telling us to excel in these gifts. And so when, when you want to operate in more of this energy or dunamis power, meditate on love. Feel God's love for the people you minister. The more you could feel for them, the more God's love in you could feel and say, I don't have God's love. You have Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to 5. God has shed His love in your heart. If you could feel the, God's love for the people, you could flow with them. Now, John Austin took it one more step further and used it as to be led by the Spirit. To be led by the Spirit. Remember how to be led by the Spirit. And he calls it being led by love. So, for example, he gives an illustration of how sometimes he could be walking about the house or doing his normal thing. Then he just feel this, this loving compassion towards a certain individual and a name came to his mind. So he didn't know what to do about it. 
until he began to realize the Holy Spirit wanted him to minister to this person. I might not be physically. So he rang this person and he phoned and he says, the Lord put it on my heart today and I feel that I've got something to, to, to minister to you. And then he prayed and the gifts of the Spirit work, God touched the other person and then he learned to flow in love. And, and sometimes, not always, sometimes God would help you pick up a person. I learned this this thing the first time the gifts of the spirit, uh, first few times the gifts of the spirit was operating. I was in um, in uh, in uh, old folks' home in uh, near Bagan's uh, Sarai. That's the province Wellesley, and uh, so uh, I was taken there to minister in the old folks' home, and we were freshly in the charismatic mood at that time, and so at the end of sharing. Uh, we give a call for healing, those who need healing to come and pray. So among those who came was a guy who couldn't lift up his hand. And then as four or five of elderly folks line up there, something very strange happened. I could feel my heart pull to this person, the, about the fifth guy on the road. Although I normally you start at the corner and then go to, feel my heart pull towards it. When I looked at this person, it was like, I could feel God's love connecting. I could feel this compassion for this person. And uh, why I look at five, I could feel it for one. That cannot explain. But it's like the love flowing towards this person. And true enough, I lay hands on all five. But when I just stand in front of this person, just say a simple prayer, his hand that cannot move, cannot move, just went up. Boom! Instant miracle. It was the gift of the Spirit working. That was how Dunami's power flow through love. And so if we learn how to flow in that Dunami's power more, so the first principle, there are other principles too. And so under Exusia, we touch on three principles. Under Dunamis, we only got time to touch on one. And the first of all principle is the, the way of love. If you could flow in love, you will see more gifts of the Spirit operate. Now, sometimes people quench the Spirit. Remember how in John it says that, uh, 1 John, it talks about how to let that love flow in your heart, not to shut the love up. And when the love wants to flow, it's not just for physical things sometimes. But who knows? Sometimes physical things. Like, how do you think Dorcas flow in her gift? Her gift is just making clothes. How do you think she flow? She felt empathy for people without clothes, obviously. She felt empathy for the poor widows. And the empathy could have moved into compassion. And then the compassion, out of compassion, she made clothes for them. And the ministry became making clothes. That was a gift. So much that when she died, God raised her up, made more clothes. A special gift of the Spirit. And this drawing of the Spirit in love, we need to be sensitive to. If some of you wonder, why the gifts of God not operating? He already trying to operate. You just didn't know to pick up the phone. You cannot hear the phone call. The Holy Spirit ringing. Ring, ring, ring. It's been ringing for the past 50 years since you were born again. He never answered the phone. Why? And you say, Why? Because we don't understand the ringing tone. And nowadays, people's ringing tone can change. Long ago, only one ringing tone. Ring, ring, or whatever. And then, then it came the digital phone. Uh, the buzz, buzz, you know. And then nowadays, everyone can choose a musical tone. And uh, so sometimes people phone ring, you wonder whether it's music playing or phone. And, but if it's your phone, you know how to recognize your tone. Because you set the tone. However, in agape love, there's one tone that all of us can hear. The way you hear agape love in your heart is the way you're led by the Spirit. Now, if you will obey agape love in your heart and flow with the compassion that God has placed in your heart, you will see your first operation of your gift. Your first operation. And then your second. Then your third. Then your fourth. As you become more and more flowing with it, Lo, you enter the dunamis wave of the Spirit. 
powerfully. So that's all the keys given. And unfortunately, our time is up. We got only one session to go. Now we got to cover chapter 1 to chapter 16 next week. Oh, no, it's all right. We have outlined, we have given main keys. Next week, we will cover more of some of those things which will lead us back into why we have um, the, the situation in Corinthian on the authority. Some of the other points, one of the other points that I didn't get to touch on is how the authority flow under a city or refuge town. And that's where you have uh, connected with uh, Paul being able to pronounce it, uh, 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 the people and on, on all the various things. And how there's a, a sense of protection on people because of the city of refuge thing. And so that was in the book of um, Numbers chapter 10. I give the wrong chapter there, last end. Chapter 10 verse 26. When there were 70 elders supposed to receive uh, the anointing for Moses' life, two were in a camp. But the Spirit still came on them because they were just part of this group, uh, what I call, they were linked in the Spirit together. And so the anointing came upon them too. So that's another thing that you will find in Corinthians uh, of the flow of Tunami's power. But for now, we learn three keys on operating exclusive power, one key on operating Tunami's power. And that should be sufficient to keep you wonderfully prosperous and led by the Spirit until next week. <laughs> and, uh, and so, this operates also in business. You got business anointing, sense you would have an anointing upon to prosper. And you'll be led by love also. You, you won't be led by selfishness, you won't be led by mammon, you'll be led by love also. And you will prosper. And so, it's a different way of leading by the Spirit. Praise God. So let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy upon our lives. We thank you, Father, for all the hidden revelations and truths you have for us in this book of First Corinthians. And Father, we have unveiled a lot. We have opened a lot, the, all the secret locks in this book, so that we could look deeper as we study and find more things, Lord, that you have hidden by your Holy Spirit so that we can understand keys to walk with you. Thank you, Father God, for your grace, your mercy upon our lives. And we give you all glory, all worship, all honor, always at all times, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all rise together. Again, we sing that song of love, a new commandment in our God. So don't forget tomorrow, all night prayer, and Saturday, the service, anointing service. New commandment I gave unto you that you love one another as I have loved you that you love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you had love one for another, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you grace and favor. May you be led by the Holy Spirit. May you function in God's authority, exousia, 
and power, and may the Spirit lead you through the love that He has placed in your heart. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, Amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a good clap. Offering God bless you. As you go.